Well, welcome to another edition of Rim Shots with Sean, brought to you with Bar- by Barstools and Band Talk. And uh, this gentleman, I tell you, got back to me in a hurry. I had some social media issues, so there's a little hiccup there. But we have the one, the only, Mr. Joey Allen from... Where, where are you sitting right now, sir? I'm in my backyard. I'm trying to keep the glare of the sun off here in Southern California. We finally got some sun, so... What part of what part of Southern Cal do you live in? I live in a town called Yorba Linda. It's, uh, you know, up by Fullerton. If you ever come out to Nam, I'm I'm like up in the hills from Nam. I know it actually. I had a friend. Uh, he used to play for the Ducks, and he lived in uh, Huntington Beach. So okay. I kind of know a little bit of that. Uh, I used to do kegger parties in HB when I was growing up. So yeah, yeah, that, that, those those things are legendary. I keep hearing all the, the <laughs> California kegger parties. Uh, right out of the gates. Uh, this is one that I, I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I'd be interested to get your, your answer. Um, you've got a catalog. You guys have been around quite a while. If if I was to ask you your, your favorite Warrant album, what would it be? Shoot. And the reason why I'm asking you this is because you're not currently pitching anything, so I hope I'm going to get the, the right answer, right? No, uh, I mean, from my, from my perspective, it would have to be probably Dog Eat Dog. Um, you know... There was a lot of things done on the first two records that didn't set well with me. We had a ghost player come in and play some solos. Not a ghost. I mean, he's a friend of ours, Mike Slamer. Not all the solos, but a few. Um, half. And then I did the other half. And and um, that was a little bit of a bummer for me just because it was a producer thing at the time. And I just went along. It was my first ride around the ro- you know ring. And so when we got to Michael Wagner and it was just, that's Warrant. You know what I mean? That's all warrant. That's all me um, and Eric. And and it's just, you know, the it was darker. The songs were darker. It was heavier. I mean, for me, I'm a, like a maiden priest guy, right? Uh, and and triumph, triumph, absolutely. And, and um, but um, so it's 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 like that's just a heavier record, and it was a lot. It was a lot of fun to make, you know. Um, um that to me is my definitely my favorite Warrant album, but it's probably one of my favorite albums of all time for a number of reasons. One, because wow. when I was growing up and learning how to play, um, you know, I had some f- friends that were metal guys, and when I say metal guys, rockers in the summertime, and you know what I mean, and they wouldn't play any sports. They used to make fun of me because I like Warrant, who was a hair metal band. And you guys came out with that album, and it was just, it was a punch in the face. It was almost a prog rock album, um, wow. you know, and. Uh, I was in a band uh, right around the time that came out, and it, that got me through an awful lot of band rides in the wintertime in southern or southern Ontario. Um, and it's one of the few albums to this day that I listen start to finish. I don't, uh, I don't uh, take oh, it wow. off. Oh, wow. That's pretty flattering. You got me blushing, if you can tell. Well, and you know what? I'm not trying to be a fanboy, but I will say that album had a huge impact on my life. And in particular, I thought Steven's playing on that album just was like, okay, anybody that has a doubt about this guy, shut yeah. the hell up. Shut the hell up. Yeah, well, you're a drummer, right? So I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Steven, um, here's the deal with Steven. He's an open-handed drummer. I know a lot of drummers, um, and I love drummers. Without, without you know, drummers, music would be shit, right? So <laughs> I don't even know if it'd be here. But really? um, you guys are the engine of, you know, and we're the wheels and the steering wheel. And then, you know, but the engine of every rock and roll band is a, dr- is a good drummer and and like Steven's got this open handed, greasy, almost swing vibe to him when he plays. Um, and you know, we've got some great friends every once in a while when Steve, you know, Steve's like we call him Steve Austin, right? Because yeah, the, the the six billion dollar man or whatever that's old, that's how old I am. <laughs> He's get you know, get a shoulder worked on, get a hip worked on, get you know, prostate cancer the guy's been through, he just had a full bypass for you know what he he dodged the widow maker <laughs> and when that happens we have friends come out one guy who's a fantastic drummer chris beale but he doesn't have that swing yeah so even though he plays the parts it, there's a greasy swingy laid back in the pocket you know and for me and him we've been playing so long together it's like we're joined at the hip you know rhythmically and it's and you really notice it when he's not there. So I, I think you're absolutely right. The guy's talented beyond belief. He's a great drummer, a fantastic singer, and, and what a, a, yeah. what and a, a singer, funny, man. And a funny man, a funny man. 
some of those slower tempo tunes that almost you almost feel like you can he's gonna fall off the drum seat. It's so laid back, but it's just it it really he's a guy like I've I've been in bands that I've covered some of your your songs, and he's a guy that um I would put in a category that um you might be able to play them, but it doesn't sound the same. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's um, so I agree with you. There you go. And uh and, and happy to say that he's probably one of those guys that I probably owe some royalty to some, somewhere along my life for stealing licks here and there. So uh awesome. Well, so I'm I'm glad you said that because that uh, I, I hoped you'd say that actually, because um that that album to me, um, uh, you know, in my mind put you guys on the map as a real band, but not that you weren't before, but it was like, man, these guys can play too. You mentioned yeah. those, you mentioned ghost players though. And yeah. um, you know. I'm glad you brought that up too. And we didn't join and never even rehearse this ahead of time. So this is good. Yeah. But why would they have done that? Because obviously you're a capable guy. And I, I remember the liner notes and I'm sorry, I'm freezing up a little bit, but Michael Wagner making that nice, you know, everybody that appeared on here actually played and, uh, and Janie actually saying, you know, you're the most underrated guitar player out there. Yeah. Why would, why would they do that? Um, why would they bring some ghost in or somebody right. else to play the pr the producer thought that we needed an Eddie Van Halen and there was no Eddie Van Halen. I'm not Eddie Van Halen. God, not even close. And, and, um, you know, but I'm influenced by Edward and Randy Rhodes and Gary Moore and there's riffs I ripped off from all those guys in there. And, and, you know, he just, it was personally me, my opinion on it is that he had, he was doing winger warrant, he was in Interscope at the time. He was one of the owners. He had a lot. His girlfriend at the time, Fiona, was doing her. He had a, like 8 billion things going on. So he wanted to go, 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 right? And <clears throat> like solos I did on the first record, Big Talk, Heaven, um, 32 Pennies, you know, uh, you, you, we could go on. Those, you know, might have taken a little longer than a guy just coming in and nailing it you know, in five minutes. And so maybe that's it along with the playing ability at the time. I mean, I wasn't as good as I am now then, you know, mm -hmm. God, but that might've been the reason behind it. And we just went with it. And it just really, at the end of the day, Mike, who played some of the souls, Mike Slamer, fantastic guy, fantastic player, good friend, love him dearly, no disrespect, but it was more of a producer, a producer thing than anything, you know? Um, and it's it, it's good to hear somebody that's had that happen to them not sound bitter because off it, it it could be pretty easy to to do that. So, um, what do you gotta do? You know, no, I, right. I took lessons from Mike. I'm like, if I'm not good enough, fuck, you know, I want to be good enough. So, I just started taking lessons from him and and um, like a lot, you know. And then I took lessons from another cat I met on the road that played with Eddie Money, a guy named Tommy Gervin that was used to be in an LA band called smile. So I all, when I'd meet a dude, I, cause we toured with Eddie money for a little bit. And when I see a dude that was just ripping it up, I'd be like, you know, like Tommy Gervin had these just bends from hell. And I was like, how do you do that? And, and it was, took me a while, but he gave me some lessons and it was fantastic. I still have a great really relationship with both of those guys, you know? Awesome. But with dog eat dog, I was finally able to shed that skin and be able to do, you know, do what I do. So there oh, yeah, dude, you definitely did. And like I say, you know, not to be a fanboy, but that, uh, that, that's one of those moments of time for me. I still listen to it probably twice a month. So, um, well, that's very flattering. Thank you very much. So a topic that seems to come up and I, I, I won't name, name the, uh, the, the site that it's on, but it, it just, it seems like every headline is blah, blah, blah. thinks backing tracks are stupid or blah, blah, blah. thinks you shouldn't tune down for a singer. I'd be interested to get your take on that because, um, you guys are a band with big vocals, big harmonies. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Did you guys use tracks back in the day? I remember you, you had a keyboard player that you used to bring out, which everybody did that. I'll um, tell you the whole history of everything. Are you ready? I'm going to be as quick as I can, and I'm going to tell you my opinion on it today. All right. I'll try to do it in five minutes. Okay. If I go over, you can kick my ass all the way from the East Coast. <laughs> so when we started out with all these layered vocals of Janie and Steven, and we did a bunch of gang vocals, Jerry and Eric and I, but Steven and Janie were really good. Um, we we did Kicks had also done a record with Bo Hill, and Kicks Kicks played with backing tracks. Everybody knew it, you know. And and so we got the same rig they had. We got these old Tascam two thirty fours 
when we did a record, we'd have tapes that would have backing vocals on them, keyboards, shakers, all the shit you can't play live, right? Without another guy or a lot of practice, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm talking about vocally mostly, okay? And and we took that on the road with us and we used it as a as a backup, like in the back of, of live, right? It was mixed down. We did a J- Japanese tour and we went over there and some shit happened where a fan, a barricade broke and a fan broke a leg. They stopped the show. Our whole tour got canceled because they had to do a, they had to do a um, look at, like an investigation into what happened before it can, can. So like we did anything wrong, right? The barricade broke and it was very unfortunate. Um, but what we said, well, how do we, what do we do now? So we said, let's go back to America on the way. It's Hawaii. Woo. Let's go to Hawaii. We sold out three nights at a big club and, you know, in like an hour because the band, the first record was jamming. And we went over there and guess what didn't make the pack? <laughs> the, the machine. <laughs> the machine. Yeah. And the tapes. Yeah. So we sat down and we started working on vocals. And that's the last time we ever used them. Okay. Then we hired a keyboard player to play all the keyboard parts. That was Scott Warren, who went on to play with Dio and Black Sabbath, you know, that or Heaven and Hell, right? Um, so from that point forward, we've never used any help right now. Uh, and that was like in 1989 when we stopped. Um, and now even more, we're hyper vigilant about vocals. So we, we, you know, one of us, and it might have been me, stumbled on this Eagles uh, broadcast of like, you know, when in the 75, 76, 77 era, where they're all five together singing a cappella, K- killer, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, it was like Queen esque, right? I mean, you get five voices together at different notes, and it's just amazing. It's so fat. So we've started working on that for the last three or four years. And we vocal warm ups every night, pretty much before we go on, you know. Um, so it's it's one hundred and ten percent live now. So if I said that, you know, don't be a pussy, don't use backing tracks, right? I'd sound like a hypocrite because we've done it before. Sure. Okay. So I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because I get it, I really do. Um, but mother, you know, take let's rip one off from Frank Zappa, Mothers of Invention you know necessity we didn't we had to scramble when our when our training wheels which is what i'll call tracks yep were left in japan and we stepped up to the big boy league and we started doing it live and we've never stopped since then and it's gotten better so the for the people <laughs> that are using track and we use a keyboard player our stage right tech is a keyboard player git grad rad player you know he does all the keyboards now live on stage we before we just didn't have them, you know, no tracks. We just didn't have them. So, <clears throat> for people that do it now, I would say, if you really want to, if you're really, a, that's what you do for a living. Work on your craft. You know, even in I'm 60 this year. Even in my late 50s, you know, I I always can learn. I can always get better. You know. Um, it's not like you just stop learning or you stop peaking as a musician. If you want to learn something, dig in, woodshed, right? Put in the time. So that's all I'd say. I mean, th- do I want to see a band 110% live when I pay money? Fuck yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, I do, If I want to listen to something that sounds perfect, I'll go, you know, get a pop and listen, you know, get a, an adult pop and put the record on, you know? So that, um, I don't I don't want to drag on people. I don't think it's great. I'm not into it, you know. Well, and I mean, I, I, I know where the little trend started. I mean, there was a radio host that was taking shots at a band and a singer, and we don't even need to discuss who it is. But to me, it's just, I don't know, um, as a drummer, being able to play to a cook track is a skill set that is, once you learn it, it's like riding a bike, but it's a hard skill to learn, right? It's um, hard to play to a click live. It is, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And you I have to when you're running tapes. I, you know, look, I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not, you know, like I said, I know that radio host well. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, that's a good guy. I know who he went after. I don't know that dude. I know some dudes in another band from the mid early '80s that are from Hollywood. That's smoke, <laughs> smoking in the boys' room. 
Let's <laughs> not give it. But you know, I toured with those guys, and they were yeah. fantastic when I toured. They talk shit about us in their book. That's what that band does. They sensationalize everything. Good for them. You know, yep. Yep. I could tell any band if you're worried about what people think about you using tracks, then work harder and don't use tracks if you can, or hire a freaking keyboard player and put them on stage. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, I, it's a, it, it's a great answer because really. Um, a friend of mine gave me a concert that you guys, I want to say it was like the nineties. It was, it was right after it was, it would have been during the cherry pie tour. Uh, tour. Uh, it was in Japan. Right. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching it and I'm going like, these guys are friggin' good live. Like Janie's voice was great. The band was tight. And I, I'd, I'd been used to seeing bands come to into Halifax that weren't great live. They were, you know, yeah. big bands. And I was sitting there waiting for the friggin' arse to fall out of the bottom. And it never happened, man. It was like, yeah. Wow. I know so, a Japanese tape you're talking about, and that's live. I mean, that's yeah. live. That's Scott Warren on keys, and, you know, that's that was us live. I mean, when you play that many shows, you know, you get better, right? No question. So now we sound fantastic. <laughs> well, and, and I was just about to say, like, it's been like 30 plus years, right? Same song. I, I, I was about to say, like, um, I, I've seen some, some, of, some of what you guys have been doing, and I mean, you know, Perfect vocalist for you guys for what you're doing, um, and I mean everybody. You know Robert Mason's a guy that's been around for a while, but just what a set of pipes. I mean, really, you guys haven't lost a beat at all. You're probably, I would say, you're even better. You know, you know what's crazy is I'm I'm sober now. I've been sober for like I don't know six months or five months or something. Whatever. I, it's not, and I don't want to ring a bell. I don't. I don't want anybody sending me any texts telling me congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't that much of a mess to begin with because I'm just a busy guy, but. I would either not drink or if I drank, I would drink. Right. So right. I just decided to stop. And so the first few shows and I would never go on, you know, in the last 20 years since I got back in the band, never go on hammered, but I'd always go on with a few pops in me, a few adult beverages just to chill, you know? And uh, now I don't do that anymore. So it's a, it's in, in pretty much the whole band's that way. Um, Eric might have a glass of wine, maybe, but, it's pretty sober when we hit the stage. So it's, it's good. And it, it the clarity is amazing and the vocal ability and everything is amazing. We've got a fantastic crew. We've got fantastic monitors every night. So it's like, you know, we're fine, you know, and then we play the same song for 30 years. You get good at them, right? <laughs> Fair enough. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds good now for what yeah. we're doing. And, and um, I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm proud of all the guys that we all work real hard at it, you know, so it's good. Good times. So with what you you're doing now, and I mean, you know, you mentioned to me before we started. So you have a uh, a day gig that you've been doing for I think you said 19 years. Yes, I've I've been uh, chained to the laptop for 19 years uh, in a day gig with Pearl Drums. And and I and uh, I I play Mapex because only Pearl wouldn't get back to me. But other than that, you know, <laughs> well, and fun, funny funny story, Joey. I was at a show uh, last week. A friend of mine who is a Pearl artist was playing, and the Pearl uh, the Pearl um, artist representative was there, and I met her, and she's a nice lady. And she said, "Why aren't you with us?" I said, "Because you never returned my email." <laughs> she kind of it was funny, but anyway, um, yeah, I don't know the Canadian rep, but I know my guy in Nashville, and and look. You know, being an artist rep for any music instrument is, is like the 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 worst job in the world because you're either <laughs> you're either loved by your artist or you're hated by your artist. There's no there's no in between. You know, like that's unfortunate that somebody didn't get back to you. Like I, you know, I if it were me, I would have gotten back to you at least and said, "Hey, this is what we can do." You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it companies are different. All companies are different. They look at ROI for artists worldwide and. It's a big deal because that money's, you know, it's real hard money when you give kits away and you support tours and things like that. You know, it costs Absolutely. money. Um, but look, Mapex is cool. My my old V my old VP uh, is the president of Mapex, Jerry Golden. Well, very nice. They treat so, me well. Mapex is cool. There all there's a lot of dudes over there. I know. Look, I don't just because I work for Pearl, which is the best reason to play drums, by the way. <laughs> uh, just doesn't mean that I rag on any other manufacturer or product everybody's filled, you know, free to choose what they want to play. It's fantastic. What I really want to talk about is we need more musicians, ah. you know, we need more drummers. We need more guitar players. We need more, more musicians in school. You know, even if it's, they're starting with band, they're starting with a, 
with a bell kit or they're starting with a snare, they're starting with guitar, violin or flute, or it doesn't matter. Just let's get more musicians and less vidiots out there, you know, for kids. And it's, it's a great gig, man. I mean, Amen. You've been music probably all your life, you know, I have, yeah. here yeah. we are talking about some, some great, you know, you, 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 you enjoy a record that I was part of, which is fantastic. It's very flattering. You know, I enjoy a lot of record, you know, records that I bought when I was a kid and these bands that some of them aren't with us anymore. There's a lot of Canadian music I like, you know, there's, mm-hmm. you know, I like, uh, I like, uh, uh, you know, Rush, of course, Triumph, uh, you know, Helix, get, you know, keep on going. Right. Um, and, and it's just a good life. Music's a good thing. It's positive. It's happy. So everybody can live. Pearl can live. Mapex can live. Gibson Fender, GMP, everybody can live, you know? Spoken like a two, true pro. As you were saying that, you, a question that, um, and, and this I think might be helpful for, for, for people that, you know, want to get into business. But when you guys were coming up, you had the opportunity to open for a lot of bigger bands um, when you were touring, and you might have some openers and stuff. And um, I'll start out with a little story. I was playing a show last week, and we use a click track, and I was having a problem getting the click track, and everybody's like, we can hear it, we can hear it, we're, we're all on it. Anyway, it turned out that I had the volume down on my tablet, typical drummer thing. Um, so our guitar player, who actually used to road, road manage some 41, three in a dead man, he goes, opening bands are a nightmare. Because you're trying to get the stage set up, and then some guy says he can't hear his tablet, and he points at me, right? What was your experience as an opener, and what's your experience with openers now if you have them? Because I think people don't understand it's a job. It's not time to ask for autographs. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm, I'm always respectful of openers and crew. Um, it's it's It takes a village to me. You know, I'm not, look, man, I'm a guitar player in a band. I got a day gig. I work. I work, you know, when I've got gigs and my, my Pearl gig, it's, it's 70 to 80 hours a week for me. And sometimes four or five, six weeks in a row without a day off. So I'm blessed to be doing what I love to do. And the people that are there doing it as well, I I have the same admiration for them that I do for what I do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so we don't, as an opening, as an opening band, Sure, we've gotten tiny stage. We've gotten no sound check. We've gotten <clears throat> our backdrop taken down. We've got our our album flats removed from from gigs that when we're an opener and there's a headliner and they you know and our record labels out there promoting and they just rip it down. All the bad stuff you've ever heard has happened. I don't need to tell you who's treated us that way. Um, I'll tell you that the guys that didn't treat us poorly had no reason to because they were kick ass right you know at the time like motley for instance motley was great on the dr phil good tour they were sober <laughs> they were live i think tommy was triggering some some samples you know but it wasn't wasn't the tape and um you know it wasn't it was it was killer so they had they, they didn't care they wanted a good show right. so the band the bands the headlining bands that think that way like from from the first band to the last note of the last band, it should be a good time for everybody that pays a hard earned dollar to come see it, right? Yep. So from those bands, we learned what to do right. From the bands that treated us like shit, we learned what not to do. You know, and and that's how we treat any opener. You know, now, you know, and and we instruct our crew. You know, be nice, give them as much room as we can afford. You know, and we don't, we're not like a two hour sound check band. We're like, we're like two songs. Yeah. Uh, as long as our front of house guy's got what he needs after he tunes the system, I, I don't want to set up there and wank on sound check. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. So, 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 um, <laughs> that's where I hope I answered the question fully. You did. You know, you did. And I'll tell you why, because you mentioned the Motley tour. I actually saw you guys on that tour and I remember. I had to go an awful long way because, you know, nothing came to Halifax when I was growing up. And uh, my takeaway was that was from top to bottom. It wasn't like a, an opener that I had no idea who the hell they were. It was an amazing opening act with an amazing show. And I really felt like I got my money's worth. Yeah, there you go. And, yeah. And, and so that's important. No figure, right? Well, and, and you, you, made, you, you know, you made a great point because I really think the bands that don't do that for some reason, they think they're going to get blown off the stage or something. Um, 
You know, I just saw Megadeth last year with uh, Boa for My Valentine, and that band was, I had never seen them before. Drummer was insane. Then Megadeth came on, and they were incredible. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like the opening band made them look bad. They enhanced the entire show, and it was great. I mean, there you go. I mean, I I don't think, I, I know Dave, not well, but I, I know both Daves. Megadeth, and, and um, you know, good for him. Good for his success, man. I mean, look, you know, I hail people that are successful in this business. It's fucking hard. Excuse my French. You know, Dude. the music business is not uh, um, easy. No, nope. you know, it's not based on it's not based on effort. It's based on effort, talent, luck. Who you know? There's so many things going on that aren't in any other job. You know, I've done IT. You know, I'm Microsoft certified. I've done IT. I'm I'm in sales now for the number one drum company in the world. And, and I know, and I work with a bunch of very talented people at, you know, some that have moved on to like your company, KHS, some that work at FMIC Fender, some that work at, you know, all over the place. I know tons of people in business and it's hard, you know, and it's not getting any easier um, because there's more, there's more um, competition with, you know, video games and social media and all this stuff that's not necessarily super healthy for people. Yep. No, when music is just like, God, you know, I don't have to tell you, right? It's yeah. just, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. So it's um. Well, you know. to that point, when I when I got on with Mapex and I ordered the the kit that I wanted, it took me a full year because there was an aluminum shortage because of the whole COVID thing, and um, yeah. you know, and 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 the joke was you're going to get it for Christmas, not this Christmas, maybe next <laughs> Christmas, right? So there, um, there were well, the the you know, I lived through a lot of the business challenges during that period with tra- worldwide transportation um you know just costs and ability to get it here and there and and then material you know material shortage and um yeah it was a difficult time for everybody you know hopefully um, we, hopefully we all learned from it uh, well th- this is the thing i, I want to ask you a question and i promise it's not going to be a salacious ask because it's going to mean i hopefully mean something but you guys have had to replace members obviously uh, you had to replace Janie. Um, Jerry's not out with you uh, currently, correct? So you had to get a fill in. So he, my comes question, out, he comes out at the end of every month. Okay, perfect. So that's great. But when you when you're looking for that replacement, and and I I, I qualify it like this: Matt Starr had thing a thing about when the Foo Fighters had to replace uh, Taylor, and they didn't have auditions. They went to their network of people and said, "Who's the guy we need to get?" Is that? I guess if if somebody was saying, okay. Joey, how do I get in this? Is that what you guys do? Would you guys do that way or would you hold auditions? Exactly that way. It's somebody that we know 10 out of 10 times. So, and what's, and what's more important to you, ability or, or the p- fact that you can actually live with them? <clears throat> it's got to be a combination of both. Okay. You know, um, ability, I mean, they, you know, you're not going to get a hack if it's your brother. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, um, so so they've got to have the ability, but they've got to fit in. Because look, you know, we're at this point. There's four original guys. Jerry, for the last three or four years, has been has been out because he's he's did it for 35 years. He doesn't like to travel. Yeah, at all, like at, at all. Like he doesn't even like to drive to my house, and he's 50 miles away from me. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um. So if we want to write, I got to go to him, which is fine, right? Yeah. But um, but it is what it is. So there's there's nothing wrong with Jerry's health. He's fine. He's that's it. You know, we get all these things. Where's Jerry? Where's Jerry? Where's Jerry? That's where Jerry is. Yep. If, if you care about Jerry, you'll be happy that he's healthy. And if he's not at your show, Robbie Crane is, and Robbie Crane's a, a fucking weapon. You know, he's played in Black Star Writers, Rat, um. Thin Lizzy, um, Vince Neal's band. He's he's an amazing, and he's known the band since the band started in '84. You know, well, I'm I'm glad you brought that because if anybody knows me, I like to rip on bass players, and <laughs> that's just my thing. But he's the guy. He always he. It's like, oh my god, how does he keep getting these gigs? And you just kind of nailed it. And I I keep telling people it's it's about networking. It's about network, and they're like, no no no, it's it's you got to be the best and 
and you just nailed it. So thank you very much, Joey Allen, for making me look smart. No, he he he. It is network, but he's one of the best. I'll tell yeah. you, he he's. I mean, he nails Jerry's parts seamlessly to where I don't even notice, and then he sings like a bird, you know. And he's the happiest, most positive guy in the world. So how, what's not the love, right? He's a family man. He's got a great family. He's just a cool dude. It's um, you know, and Jerry, I, you know, would you rather have Jerry out twenty four seven? Of course. I mean, Jerry, it's Jerry's gig. But Jerry's not there for a reason, and Robbie is absolutely the man for the job, and and um, we're we're lucky to have him. To be honest with you, you know. So coming up, I mean, I, I you know I'm a little envious of you guys the way that you guys get to do it now, right? Where it's not you know pounding around for eight nine months in a row like you get. <laughs> I, I'm guessing you get to pick and choose what you take on, and you know it's not a. It's it's not a have to do, it's a want to do. So what's coming up for you guys? Because you're up here in Canada the last little bit, and you, you always seem to be super active. Um, what do you guys have uh, coming up? We've got um, shows. Um, you can go to our Facebook, our Instagram, or our website. I think it's warrantrocks.com. And, and our tour's on there, and as we add dates, we do about 50 dates a year. We're getting up into Canada more because we got a Canadian agent. Oh. So here's the deal with our band. We never branded in Europe, okay? We haven't been back to Japan or Australia in forever. Even the Australia, we had a gold or platinum record. Canada, we had two platinum records. Mm -hmm. And all we got to do is convince your border people to let us in. <laughs> which, is, which is easier now than it has been. Sure. Um, but no, can they, can Canada is just like, it's a neighbor, you know, your, your good neighbor. So... We want to play more up in Canada, and we're trying to work it out. Um, so that run we just did in Calgary and Edmonton was the beginning of that agent, and and those shows sold well. So hopefully we'll do more up there. But you know we're we're big in the meat and potatoes, the the heart of rock and roll of America. We we can do two thousand to five thousand seats, depending on how it's promoted and where the gig is, and that's fine for us. Um, it's important to have a good good live show. You know, we're doing 17, 18 songs a night. Wow. It's not like 10 and like, you know, like a guitar solo, drum solo, harmonica solo, kazoo solo. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we don't do that shit. We want to give people music and we want to give it to them live. And, <clears throat> and I write the set. I'm pretty much the MD for that portion of it. And we just, that's it. You know, new record. I don't know. You know, the last one was great. <laughs> The last one was fun to make, and and Jeff Pilson was fun to work with, and the one before that with Keith Keith Olson, God bless, God rest his soul, was great and and fun to do. It, it's such an undertaking for us, and it's <laughs> and the return on making a record is like, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like it's it, and not everything's about money. It's like, can we play it live? Right. Well, you can. But people are just going to sit there and look at you like, where's Cherry Pie? Where's Uncle Tom's Cabin? Where's Down Boys? Where, you know, where are those hits I want to hear? And and so you can't go out and play three or four or five new tunes, which would be, for me, thumbs up. Yeah. I, I would dig to do that, you know? But but we have a responsibility to, to play the songs that people really want to hear, too. So... It's a double-edged sword, you know what I mean? And and that's what I mean when I mean, you know, what's in it for us. It's not financially. It's like the thing in it for us is to play new music, to create new music, to grow. Right. To, 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 to just not be a nostalgia act. So I don't know if it'll be a new record and if it'll be a song at a time or whatever. I'm sure sooner than later something would happen, but nothing's going on right now. Um, and I fear this will be a question that you've been asked a million times, and I promised that I wouldn't do that, but I'm going to anyway. Do you ever get bored of playing those songs after all these years? Well, you you do. Anybody does. And then you start having a beer before you go on, making <laughs> it a little different. And then you have another beer before you go on. <laughs> then you have two beers and a shot of tequila before you, you know. And then you start. I'm not going to play the solo the same way I did on the record. I'm going to, I'm going to add lib a little here because I'm bored and I want to do something different, you know? And to be honest with you, um, after the COVID break, which was a good 18 months for everybody that played, right. Yep. Some more in different places. 
Because I know you guys were a little more strict up there where you didn't get out as quick as we did, right? Oh, gosh. Yeah. And um, and and when we started to come back out, I put the records back on. And I went back, and I'm like, I want to make it sound like the record. Right? Yeah. And, and that's what the band's done. So, so, like, that keeps it from getting boring to me, you know? Well, and the reason why I asked you, because I remember seeing a, a, an old interview with Janie where he said he didn't want to be, you know, he hated being known as the cherry pie guy. But I kid you not, I was in a school the other day and there was a little three-year-old girl walking down the school with her mom and she was singing cherry pie. And obviously she had heard it on the radio or something. So yeah. it is that double-edged sword, right? Yeah, I think for him, he was drunk in an interview and, you know, <laughs> yeah. he, his catalog is a, is a singer. And, and by the way, God bless him. We miss him terribly. Uh, that whole thing's a whole nother interview and nightmare to be yeah. on. There's good and bad, you know, obviously yep. all the good leading up to his real hard struggles and death, uh, untimely death for sure. Um, and, and, uh, but he had such a deep catalog that he got pit, pit you get pinned for this pop, you know, hit. Yep. Um, it's got a video out there. That's like a, the video to us was like, we wanted to make the most, obviously blatant silly video we could some people took it too seriously um i think rolling stone called it the most tasteless video of 91 <laughs> we laughed at we're like you're they got it kind of yeah like yes it is tasteless but it doesn't need an award right yeah rolling stone who cares anyway <laughs> i know right so yeah. Um, but yeah i mean um he didn't want to get pigeonholed as that guy because his, his his catalog was deep and he was a great songwriter so I get it, you know, but it's not boring. It's fun. We're look, we're blessed to be able to do this at, you know, 35 years after records came out. And um, you know, no complaints from us at all. The only complaint is, you know, is traveling, maybe. Yeah, traveling yeah. sucks. You know, that's about well, it. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I had the pleasure of doing a wedding. I playing a wedding in Dublin, Ireland this summer. Oh, that's bitching. Well, and you gotta fly. From Halifax to Toronto, and then Toronto to Dublin. If it, it, you got to go back backwards to go forwards, right? It's just ridiculous. It, it happens. Hey, happens down here in the states every weekend for us. Well, there you go, right? And yeah. uh, anyway, they our our connector got messed up the very first day. We had to stay overnight. In Toronto. Anyway, we got over there, and it was great. It was you know get to visit Phil Lynott's grave and his house and um big Thin Lizzy fan. Huge. Right, me too, my friend. Me too. Huge Thin Lizzy fan. Have you ever been to his grave? I haven't been over there, even though I'm 27 percent Irish. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say, are you Irish? Uh, uh, Irish Italian, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, I, I, I mean, I, you know, Robbie, I got Robbie knows it plays with you know Black Star Riders with Scott Gorham. Yeah. So I got, I got a, I got a message to this day on my cell phone from Scott Gorham, um, because I sent Robbie over there one time when he was going over to gig with um, with Live and Dangerous. Oh yeah. And I said, just get Scott to sign it. <laughs> Scott's got it in front of him. He's calling me from England on the road. Do you want me to write Joey or Joseph or Joe or Yeah? And, and then I called him back and we had a great conversation. And I've I've met Scott a few times and they almost got Brian uh Robertson to sign it. Oh, nice, nice. Um, so, anyways, big thing. Phil, Phil Why not to this day is the biggest star in that country. And we were at his grave, and this man, he's about 70 years old, comes over, and he goes, uh, I asked him where Phil's house was. He goes, well, it's just around the corner. And I said, well, is it a walk? He goes, give me five minutes. And he drove us. I've got a picture of him and me in the driveway, and uh, just beautiful, beautiful country. So if, if you ever yeah. get a chance, I'll, I'll send you a picture that you might oh, find I'm interesting. I'm going to go over there. I might have to start drinking again when I go over there and ask him. <laughs> well, they've got a lot of walking streets, and I'm like in the middle of the street, four corners at 10 in the morning. Music bumping, people drinking Guinness. It was incredible. Yeah. But my point was the travel to get there was hell. Right. So I, I feel your pain. It's not as glamorous as everybody thinks. That's what, Look we, get, for, that's what we get paid for is travel. That's you know? pretty much you're you're bang on. You're bang on. Um I don't want to 125 flights a year, so <laughs> it is what it is. Frequent flyers. Um Look, I don't want to keep you all day because I know you're a busy fellow and you finally get some time off. I really appreciate you doing this. Um not a problem. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story because I, I have the pleasure of interviewing a number of people that you know uh, you would know and know you. And uh, I was talking to one of them the other day, and I said, uh, "Yeah, I'm going to be talking to Joey on Saturday." And it was like, great guy, funny guy, 
underrated guitar player. That's ex- and two people said the exact same thing. They don't really know each other. Yeah. So I I don't know if that's going to be what's going to be on your headstone when when you leave this world, my friend. But uh, uh, it's I think I'm that's a no headstone. Have you ever seen the Big Lebowski? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the I'm gonna be in that urn that blows back and hits everybody in the face. <laughs> Beautiful, that guy. I so, love it, man. I uh, thanks for the opportunity. I love I love uh, I love your country. I, seeing that you were a drummer, I hopped on it and. and uh, and I'm glad to talk to you. Thanks for asking some cool questions, man. Well, thank you so much, Joey. We'll right talk on. to you soon, brother. Cool.